All right, well, we are in the last sermon, last sermon of a collection of talks that we've been uh, entitling Relationships Built Different. Have you guys been blessed this month of February? I really hope so. We try our best to to meet the needs and and to speak life when we can. And so today's message is titled, uh, Husband and Wife Built Different. Husband and Wife Built Different different. And uh, well, since I'm going to be talking about husband and wife built different, I thought it would be different if it wasn't just a husband up here speaking, but there was a wife up here speaking as well. So once you put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Pastor Liz Vasquez in the house. What's up, Journey Church? Praise the Lord. So good to have you here, babe. I love preaching with you. I do too. You do? Preaching with you. Awesome. It's great. Um, I want to say, as we begin to talk about husband and wife roles, we have a lot of single people in the room as well. And when you hear messages like this, it's important, you know, you don't disconnect and you kind of just imagine and think about when that day comes, if that day comes, if God calls you to be married, how to prepare for that. I think that's important because I think a lot of people think that we're super alike because we're both Puerto Rican. We both love Jesus. We're both between the height of 5'4 and 5'9. And so (laughs) it's like, man, you must have like a lot in common. And we're actually really different in a, in a lot of ways. Like, you're super organized. I, I didn't grow up in a home where I had grandma. Grandma put everything away. You know, I didn't know where things went. Yeah. And so, but when we, and I always would lose things as a result. But when yeah. I got married to you, you had this one sentence. It changed my life. It was, what was it? It was. Everything has a home. Everything has a home. Guys, this will change your life. Your keys have a home. Yeah, your, when we were dating, you kept losing your keys. Do you yes. That? Yeah, no, I've been married for 15 years, and it has been 15 years since I've lost my keys. Because <laughs> my keys have a home now. They go in a certain place, change my life. Um, I think I've never laughed at a dog video, ever. But you... Yeah, how many of you guys like those Instagram dog videos? Yeah. So all the time. I don't know what it is. She's like, just, babe, you got to look at this dog. I'm like, it's a, it's it's a dog. It's just something funny about dogs doing human things. Doing dog know. things. He just he so. does it. I try to get into it, but in my defense, you've never stayed awake during a football game. That's not true. So. <laughs> I, stay I watched Alicia Keys. <laughs> she wasn't even the show. She wasn't even the show. Um, and then I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a dirty person. I'm just not no. as neat or clean yeah. as you. I think that's, yeah. we're very different. No, you're not dirty at all, but that white shirt might not stay white. It's not going to be day. white by the end of the day. That's true. Um, food just gets attracted to me. I don't know why. Yeah. That's what we'll My say. clothes and my mouth. Um, food gets attracted. That was what I was saying. Um, but the difference we want to talk about today is not necessarily the difference in our personalities. What we really want to talk about today is the difference in our roles, our God-given roles that we play. My God-given role that I play as the husband in the marriage. Yeah, and my God-given role as I play as a wife in the marriage. Now, I want to just preface this by saying, because I know with the day and age that we live in today, I want to say that the world has made and needs to continue to make progress Tremendous progress when it comes to equal rights. Women for too long have not been afforded equal pay, have not been afforded equal opportunities or equal platforms. And we are in agreement with that. And the Bible is in agreement with that. And the Bible would also say, in addition to that, listen, that you can have equal rights and different roles. And so what we're talking about today is not that one person is more important than another at all, but rather like the part of a body, the hand does something different, the foot does something different, and when we embrace what God designed us to work within the marriage, it really is healthy. And before we can talk about the Bible's picture of what a husband and a wife should be, we should all be honest at the fact that whether you're married or not, you have a picture of how a husband and wife should be, or what they should look like. And the best way to exemplify this is, I don't know how many people played this game growing up called Pictionary. My mom loves Pictionary. She used to play all the time with the families from church. And and if you don't know what Pictionary is, it's a very frustrating game because you got this timer, so there's dash dress, uh, the timer, and then you got a card, and this card has something on it, and you got to try and draw whatever's on your card, but the kicker is you can't use your words. So I got a picture I'm going to start preaching, but I cannot communicate the picture. So you got to guess what I want. Are you following me? They ought to call it not Pictionary. They ought to call it Picture Mary. 
because we all got an idea of what a husband or a wife should be. But the husband and the wife that we marry has no idea of the idea that we have. And so we try to spend the whole marriage trying to get them to be what we're envisioning, and they don't know. And at some point, I don't know if you ever played Pictionary, and the other person's just not getting it. You're like, I need a new partner. Yeah. 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 I need a new, this partner sucks. I need a new partner. You are not getting it. And uh, I think that happens a lot of times in our relationships. Yeah. Yeah, so like, let's say, for example, I have a card that says, a husband that provides. And so for me, I'm going to, and he can't see that card. Let's just act like he can't see it I right can't now. see that card. Yeah. But I'm going to end up trying to draw a picture of what I think a husband that provides looks like. And that's going to be on my past experiences, pop culture, maybe what my dad was like yeah. for my mom. And so for me, let's say I draw this. I'm an artist, y'all. And this is what a man or a husband that provides looks like. And for me, what a husband that provides looks like is someone who is open to me emotionally, who, who speaks to me, who asks me about how my day was, who, who opens up to me, basically. And for him, maybe he would look at yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I'm like a heart surgeon, uh, <laughs> a CPR, Care Bear. Uh, Care Bear. If you're uh, the 80s. I got no idea what you're looking for. Yeah, and so like for him, he might get frustrated because he's like, I don't understand what this is. This is not a husband That's that not provides. providing to me. Yeah. For him, maybe a husband that provides is this, That's right? And so, like, maybe, you know, as a wife, you're upset because you're, like, you're not opening up to me emotionally. And the husband's like, you Good. got a house. We got a like, roof over our head, girl. Right. What are you talking about? The electricity. Like, I'm I love providing, you. You don't see the right? food in that fridge? Yeah. That sandwich says, I love you. Yeah. I'm providing. Bought you a car. We went on vacation. Yeah. What more do you want? Yeah. And then the wife is like, but you know what? I need more. Okay. Like, <laughs> I just, I want more. And, you know, and she gets frustrated because she's like, I want more. And he's like, you know, I just took you on vacation. I don't understand what more you want. Or maybe you are a husband that provides you hustle and you are open to your spouse emotionally, but maybe you lack spiritual debt. Mm. And, and maybe for you, you know, maybe the wife is like this morning, you're like, hey, babe, let's go to church. You know, and the husband's like, babe, we just went to church like last month. Like, I don't, <laughs> how often do you want to go to church? church you know, we live at church. What do you, you know, and then as a wife, maybe you can get frustrated and you're like, you're not getting the picture and the time is ticking. I'm done with this. I, I don't want to be a part of this team anymore. Yeah. And the husband, it's not it's easy for us. We're going to go talk about that now. Like I got a card. My card says a wifey that holds it down. A wifey that holds it down. I told my wife that I was going to do this one. She was like, what does that even mean? I was like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What is a wifey that holds it down? It can mean so many things. So this is, this is my drawing here. This is Liz. Is that my curly hair? Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so you could think that maybe a wifey that holds it down. It's baby. That's it's a right. burrito. But she's like, <laughs> a wifey that holds it down makes burritos? I don't know. What do you... You want tacos? No, you know what? Maybe you had a mom that was super nurturing and super caring and stood home and raised the kids. And so you're like, no, if I'm going to get married, then my wife is going to be a stay-at-home mom, and she's going to take care of the kids, because that's my idea. And she's like, well, that's not my idea. Uh-uh. I went to business school. This is my briefcase right here. That's a briefcase. And so, <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't watch the kids tonight. Well, I got a meeting. Well, I got a meeting, too. I worked too. My day was tired. I can't take the kids to their game. I, my day was tiring too. I'm just as exhausted as you are. Or maybe, uh, guys, your, your image of, uh, of it is a, a woman who... Is that a receipt? You go shopping? It's not a receipt. What is that? <laughs> Come on. Bacon, yeah. You could be my partner. Bacon. <laughs> All right. Maybe your idea of a wife is you got to learn how to cook. You got to be, you know, Miss Susie Homemaker and all of that. But that's not who you married. You know, you come home and it tank DoorDash again, five nights in a row. Can we make a, a piece of bread, toast it at least? Or, and but that's not what, what you guys had imagined. And then another layer of frustration is when y'all try to get together and you have different expectations of what sex should be. Because one of y'all were addicted to pornography for a decade, and so your image of sex is what? Two Hollywood actors do on a screen for 45 minutes, and you try to pull that into your relationship, and it's not realistic. It can be very frustrating when you are not on the same 
page. And I remember when we got married, we each had roles that we were expecting each other to fill that we didn't communicate literally until like on our honeymoon, we talked about some of this we stuff. Did. We were like, we should probably figure out how we're going to, you know, do our life together. Yeah. And so I remember one of the things that I had said was, hey, listen, I don't really enjoy cooking that much. Um, do you think that you could take on the role of cooking? And she was like, yeah, I could take on the role of cooking. But she didn't know that I was going to have that expectation until after we got married. Yeah. So when I communicated to her, that's cool. But she didn't go to culinary school. Yeah. So I'll never forget the first meal she ever made for our family, me, was rice and a chicken leg. And the chicken leg was so orange. That was a sasson. <laughs> yeah, but she OD'd on you that sasson. You know, you know. That's what my mom told me. <laughs> so, and, then I, and then I bit into it, and when I bit into it, the chicken leg went <laughs> I pulled out, it was bleeding, y'all. It's bleeding, y'all. Okay, it was because I had fried it. Okay. You don't have to apologize, I forgave you. It's on him. It's already All right, over. Well, it's already it's in the about past. to be your turn, so. <laughs> and so she wasn't prepared for that role. And then she has some expectations to me that I wasn't prepared yeah, for. Your turn. So I. <laughs> okay, the time is ticking. I, I had the expectation, or I asked him if he could fix everything that was broken. But just when we were dating, yeah. I remember one time my tire went flat. We were at my brother in law's house, my sister's house. Yeah. And he was, was like, like, oh, I got, I got this, I got this. And I'm like, you sure? He's like, yeah. That tire, he should have, it should have taken him like 30 minutes to change it. And it took like two hours, so. I did. I had never changed a tire before in my life. I, I jacked it up before I tried to take the lug, nut, lug nuts off. Yeah, it just kept spinning. So the wheel just kept spinning. I couldn't figure out what was happening. <laughs> she kept checking in on me every 30 minutes. I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. I got my phone now. I'm like, how to change a tire? I'll be right in there. Just relax. I'm doing it the right way. It takes longer. <laughs> I didn't know. Here's the problem. Listen, you've got these expectations on your spouse to be this thing, but they didn't go to school to do the thing that you need them to do. Yeah. And so they are not prepared to live up to that role or that expectation, and it can be a little frustrating. Now, if you're taking notes, we don't have a slide for this, but I want you to already start writing some things down. Because what we're talking about in those examples, those are what I would call the surface roles. Another way to describe them would be those are the changeable roles. Anybody in the marriage can be a cook. Anybody in the marriage can be the person who fixes things. Anybody in the marriage can be the designated bug killer. Yep, that's, you. that's me. I'm the designated yeah. bug killer in our home. She refuses. We had to make an agreement on that. There's a bug in the house, you kill it. If there's a rat in the house, you got to get it out of here, whatever. So that's me. So those are the surface roles. Those are the changeable roles. But also, according to God, listen, there are some what I would call unchangeable roles. These are the core roles of a marriage. And what I really want to hone in on, because the first set of roles requires a conversation between you and your spouse, but this you and I can do, you and we can do together. What are the unchangeable roles? What are the core roles for a husband and a wife in a marriage? The things that God designed for you to be, and we're going to go ahead and begin. And the first core role or unchangeable role, we'll start with the husband here. The husband's role is a sacrificial leader. Didn't get a lot of amens in the first service for that one either. Um, and I think it's because of just bad experiences and interactions. Let me just say, if that got you upset for a moment, what qualifies the leader is the sacrificial. Yeah. That's what makes that sentence. Because you could be the sacrificial, listen, you could be the leader and change the diapers. You could be the leader and feed the kids. You could be the leader and be the stay-at-home parent while your wife goes off to work and makes the money. Because a sacrificial leader, listen, a leader usually asks their people to sacrifice for them. But a sacrificial leader is willing to sacrifice for his people. So the husband is saying, whatever I got to do so that my wife is good, whatever I got to do so that my family is good, that is what I will do. If it requires staying home, if it requires going out, I'm going to sacrifice so that my people are taken care of. So important, guys, that you understand this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And further, submit to one another. Someone say one another. One another. Out of reverence for Christ. For wise, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. Verse 22 is so often misquoted and taken out of context because it's not built on the preface and on the foundation of verse 21. Yes, wives submit to their husband, but before that, it says submit to one another. 
together. And if the submit to one another is not in place, then what was meant to be building can become abusive. The Bible, this is the takeaway item if you're taking notes. The Bible doesn't just teach female submission. It teaches mutual submission. This is it. This is, this is what breaks down all of the false doctrine and all of the bad teaching and all the accusations against the church and the Bible. It's mutual submission. For the wife, the wife submits to the husband, and Pastor Liz will break down that word submit in her point when she speaks next. But husband, this is what mutual submission looks like on your side. Verse 25, for the husband, this means love your wives. Oh, goose, cool, so I just get her flowers every now and then. I'll sing her a little song every now and then. Mm-mm. He qualifies the kind of love. Just as Christ loved the church, and in case you forgot, he died for the church. Yeah. If you're taking notes, write this down. The husband must sacrifice his will for her well-being. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So, so if you're going to talk about it in the practical terms, so I become the tiebreaker in a disagreement, but the decision that I make has to be in her best interest. Yeah. Has to be for her well being. You'll never read Genesis chapter 2 the same way again. Genesis chapter 2 is beautiful, verse 21, the creation of man and woman. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep, someone say sleep, to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he slept, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs. God took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Verse 22, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Now, the Hebrew word for deep sleep here is actually translated in the Hebrew for supernatural sleep. In the New Testament, we see it not just as a word for sleep, but as a metaphor for death, a death. I don't know how many of you remember the story, but there was a, a, a young girl who passed away Her parents got Jesus to heal her, but when she got to the building, they said, it's too late, thank you for coming, she's already dead. And Jesus looked at the parents and said, she's not dead, she's asleep. Paul, when he talks about the the saints, you and I, who are going to resurrect from the dead, he says, these Christians are not dead, they're asleep. So sleep is a metaphor for death, they're interchangeably used. Oh, this is powerful. So when Adam was put to sleep so that Eve could be created, we see a beautiful picture of the woman's body earth being initiated from the husband's death. The man had to die so that the woman could come out. Ephesians 5, 26 in the message version, I love what it says, everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best of her. In the same way Christ had to die to give birth to his bride, the church. Husbands, we must die. Die. What you mean? Die. Slip my wrist, what you mean die? I mean die to your selfishness, die to your ambition, die to your pride, die to your will, die to my way, die to I'm the man, die to you go do what I say, die to that so that she can be everything that God created her to be. Amen? I I hope there's some men are saying amen too and not just the women. It's called amen. So I need some of the men to say amen on that too. I remember when we were moving to Winter Park to start the church, I didn't want to go because we were living in South Chase. She wanted us to move to Winter Park because that's where we were going to start the church. And I don't know if you're familiar with the real estate market. (laughs) Difference between South Chase and Winter Park. It's expensive. To clarify, if you don't know, if you're watching online, our supermarket back in South Chase was Publix. Over here at Winter Park, it was Whole Foods. Different brackets of income. I told her, I don't think we can afford to live out there. She said, but if we don't move out there, she said, who am I going to have a relationship with? How am I, you're going to plant a church, you're going to be out there busy all day. Who am I going to be making friends with? It was like 45 minutes away. Who am I going to get connected with? And I started to realize that it was in the best interest of my wife, even if it meant I had to work more hours, even if it meant I had to put in more work to get this church started, was to move into the city. And so we did it. And when we did it, listen, it wasn't just her who thrived. Our whole family thrived. Our church thrived. We started meeting people in the city that we never met that became members of the church, which I was like, thank you so much for speaking up. Because if you hadn't spoken up and if I didn't listen, we would have missed out on this church becoming what it needed to be. So husbands, let me tell you how you can be a leader. Here's how you start by being a leader. Husband, listen. Listen. (laughs) Wives, as much as you want to clap for these points, can I just encourage you? (laughs) Don't. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> just don't. All right? Because, because yeah, just don't. Um, like, listen. But uh, <laughs> husbands, listen. Now, because now, how can you know what she needs if you didn't ask no questions? So you got to ask. And then when she speaks, the word to describe wife in the Old Testament is helper. The only time that word is used in the New Testament is to describe the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit's job in our life? Of many things, it's to tell us what God wants to tell us. So God speaks through the Holy Spirit to us. This is why you need to listen to your wife, because so many times it's not just her speaking. Husbands, it's God speaking through your wife to you. And so I don't even call it listening to her anymore. Now I call it listening to the Holy Spirit. That's what I call it. Because I know that there are times that God is on her and he spe- I need to listen because God's trying to speak to me and he's using my wife to speak to me. And after she gives her opinion, after she gives her thoughts, husband, lead. Lead. You got to lead. And I think that there is an anti-leadership sentiment that snuck into the female empowerment movement. And it's not either or. We need both and. We need women to be empowered and we need husbands to lead. We need both. And I want to also say, I don't know why we get so tight at that point, because we love leadership in every other aspect of our lives. We need it. You know, the world does not work without leadership. It's the way that God ordered the world. Every organism has a leading organ. Every organization has a leading position. Heaven is functional in the way that it is functional, because even heaven has order, angels, archangels, seraphim, cherubim, the trinity, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's order. Even hell, for all of its rebellion, and that kingdom was founded on rebellion, is only functional because hell itself has order. Read Ephesians 6. Rulers, principalities, powers, uh, evil forces in the heavenly realms, Satan, Lucifer. There has a, there's an order. There's a structure. In order for something to be functional, it needs order. It needs leadership. Ladies, wives, let me help you out. Husbands leading is not the problem. It's husbands not leading well that is the problem. But if husbands lead well, and and we're going to talk about what leading well is. I already started talking about it. You know, listening and sacrificing, then this functions. But because it's a partnership, the wife has to allow the husband to lead. Yes. Yes. So the second point is a wife's role is submitted partner. Submitted partner, and I and I know when I say that S word, it's like if I just cringed. Everybody right cringed. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I just said the other S word, <laughs> and and I get it, okay, and so do I. But I know that this year our focus is foundations built different, and we're going to the word yeah. for everything that we do. So let's just before you start throwing stuff at me, ladies, let's just read the Bible, okay? Husbands, so. don't say amen during any of this. They can say amen, just don't, like, so loud. Like, <laughs> Under your breath. Like, point to your wife. Like, don't, don't be doing none of that, because then you're going to have problems. So Ephesians 5, 22 to 24 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And I'll explain everything later in a second. Um, but just to start out, I, I know a lot of you might look at me and you think, you know, pastor's wife, she's, she's probably so submissive, right? Like, listen, <laughs> that's why you see that face. People come to me and be like, man, if my wife was as following and as submissive as your wife, our marriage would be great. I'm like, you don't know my wife. No. <laughs> I don't know who she is, who she right. was. How I was, okay? So, and anytime anyone comes to him and they're like, I'm having a problem with a wife, like, go talk to Pastor Liz, okay? Because I, I really had a hard time with this. And mostly I think it's because I grew up in a Hispanic home. I know we said we were Puerto Rican. I'm a Puerto Rican woman. You try to tell a Puerto Rican woman what to do, and those are like fire words, okay? Like, you couldn't tell me what to do. My dad... Uh, taught me. I grew up in a home where he was like, you don't need a man. You know, I had a a business with my dad even before I met him. I was saving money in the bank because my dad taught me, you don't need a man to buy a house. And so I was saving money to buy a house. And I had money in the bank and he was broke, okay? And (laughs) he had no money. I mean, whatever money you did have, to be fair, you spent it on me to like log it in. So there's that. And then also, he's five years younger than me, y'all. So, yeah, I remember when you got, you were like, who is this older woman trying to, JJ's mom? My mom was not about it at first. At first. Like, who is this crib robbing? (laughs) 
that she met me and all changed. But anyways, what was I saying? So the age oh, also, was tough. Yeah, the age was tough, and like I, I remember just trying to run a car one time. Like so embarrassing. Yeah. In some states, you have to be 25. Yeah. So I remember we went on we went on like a vacation. I went tried to rent a car, and they were like, "Sir, you have to be 25." I was like, "Babe, you got to do this." Yeah. <laughs> And I'm supposed to submit to him, okay? So I had a hard time with that, to be honest. And so if you have a hard time with it, I relate to you. But something that I realized is not so much that I had a problem with submitting, more that I had a problem with trust. And so, wives, if you're taking notes, we need to trust. And what I realized is the reason why I had a problem with trust, it wasn't even so much that I wasn't trusting him, but I realized that I wasn't trusting God because God designed it in a way where he needed to search God for the decisions that were being made in our family. So if he's searching God and God is speaking to him on the decisions that need to be made for our family, and I'm not trusting the decisions that he's making, then I'm basically not trusting God because God spoke to him. That's good. You know, and so then I realized my issue really really isn't that I'm not trusting God because the Bible talks about wives submit to your husband as you do unto the Lord. So first, you need to learn how to trust God because then it's easier when you go to trust your husband. And also, wives, why are we having such a hard time with this? Because, you know, you submit to other forms of authority, teachers, counselors, uh, police officers. You listen to the police officer more than you do your own husband or maybe even a doctor. Like if you go to the doctor's office and you're sick and he tells you to go to CVS and and take this medicine or whatever. You listen to him more than you would listen to your spouse. And I brought this point up to my husband and he's like, yeah, babe, but doctors have a degree, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's true. There's a piece of paper called a degree that tells, that gives the the doctor authority. But something that husbands have is a decree from God that says that we have to submit. So as hard as it is, just trust God and listen to what he's saying for you to do. And then I realized also that it's, this is actually an easier job. Like he said before, husbands have to die, right? Ephesians 5, 25 says, husband, love your wife, Jesus Christ, love the church. He gave up himself for her. So they have the part of dying to themselves. We just have to follow the final decision that they make. So then I realized like, I'm trying to control everything, but why don't I just allow him to be the one to lead? And I actually have the easier job. And just so you know, submission doesn't mean mindlessly obeying reckless authority, okay? It doesn't mean them being harsh and dominating over you. If you're in that situation, this is totally different for you, okay? There are lines. He can't be abusing you. He can't be um, asking you to commit a sin. You're not a slave. Your opinion matters, okay? And so if you're in There's that situation, There's a difference between different. submitted and yeah. enslaved, yeah. and uh, you can't be abusive, like you right. said. You can't lead to sin, yeah. all those things. It's yeah, really and, and, and my my uh, opinion matters, right? right? This is a partnership, so my opinion right. matters. So uh, I know before we started the church, is a, another house story, but before we started the church, um, I remember you had a job as a youth pastor and a professor at Southeastern University. And again, we lived uh, closer to the church that he was youth pastoring at, and we needed to find a, a, a place to live that was kind of in between both jobs, because he was driving an hour just to teach at the university. And there was this town called Celebration Florida, and if for those of you who are from the area, you know it, it was basically built by Disney. And so I was like, this is my dream, right? I want to live in this town built by Walt Disney. And so at the time, because he had two jobs, we were able to afford it. So he wasn't broke no more. So, but, and I'm like, this is my dream, babe. And I remember us looking at the house. We even started picking tile and all that. And on the way home, he said something to me. He's like, I don't know, babe, I I really want to make you happy. And, and I want to have your best interest in mind, but I just feel like God is going to ask us to step out of faith. And we need to save all this money that we're making now because he's going to ask us to step out of faith. I didn't know what it was, and I was listening. I wanted her to be happy. Yeah. Your husbands, you want your wives to be happy. You, that's like what we die for. We die to make them happy. But I felt like I was going to ask them to do something really big really yeah. soon. I didn't know what it was. And that was to start the church. And thank God that I didn't fight it. And I was like, all right, I guess I will just let go of that dream. But I'm so glad that we did. And I followed that decision because it brought us to where we are here today. And it we wouldn't have been able to start the church if it wasn't for that because all of our money would have been tied up in that house. Mm-hmm. And so the reason why I share that story is because that's a really good picture of your relationship with God. Sometimes God asks you to do things that don't make sense. At the time, it made more sense to buy that house. But 
this is what God wanted for our family. And so sometimes we just need to understand that it might not make sense, but follow his lead because God is speaking to him. And I want to speak real quick to single people because I know we've been talking to married people this whole time. Um, Single people, especially for, for the guys, since husbands have to die and wives have to submit, then listen, guys, don't marry a woman that's not worth dying for. And men don't, and and women don't marry a man that's not worth submitting to. So you gotta make sure you can't clap. Ouch, at least something. You told the guy to be quiet. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're dating right now, this is the time to figure that out, especially for the ladies. You need to care more about his yeah. leadership roles because they need to be the ones to lead yeah. than you do about his looks. That's the criteria. Yeah. Can I trust him? Right. And like, will I die for her? Yeah. Yeah. And that's important. So, so, ladies, you need to pay attention to how he handled his finances because that's not going to change, right? Like, what is he spending money on now? Does he save? Does he spend it all crazy? Because that's what he's going to do when you get married, and that's one of the top you know, reasons for divorce and, and how does he speak to his mother or women for that matter? How, what does his prayer life look like? You know, does he read the Bible? I remember when we were dating and I called you one time and you didn't answer the phone and then I called back and you called back and I was like, what happened? And you're like, I was in my prayer closet. And I remember I was like, what is a prayer closet? Like, I'm like, do you have a closet just so that you could she pray? I thought I had a closet in my house that did not have clothes in it that was dedicated to prayer. <laughs> I was like, no, this like, is what, what that is means. That? That's just Christian terms for just spending time with God. But the reason why I share that is because it's important that uh, when you call him, are you interrupting him? And his, is he praying? Is he reading the Bible? That's so important because you want to make sure that you're marrying a leader. And why is this important? Because we, you have to trust him and you have to trust that he has a relationship with God that you could trust. Yeah, the relationship with God part is so important. And we're going to have to pick it up a little bit for the time. But guys, this is so important that you have a relationship with God because here's your second unchangeable core role if you're a husband. The husband's role is righteous servant. Righteous servant. Verse 23, chapter 5, Ephesians. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. So now there's a spiritual element being introduced here, something spiritual being introduced. Verse 26, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Again, a spiritual action, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So we got a spiritual tool. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. The image that Paul is eliciting here is the image of a priest. A priest is the one who, who did the, the cleansing ceremony. A priest is the one who made the things holy with the actions. A priest was the one who did the washing. So husbands, listen to me. You are not just the leader of your home. You are the priest of your home. And that is not just a leadership position. That's a servanthood position. The priest got treated sometimes some of the worst in the, in the nation of Israel. They didn't get any land, for example. All the other nations got lands, but the Levites, where the priests came from, they got no land. Every other nation in Israel had a day off. I'm a big believer in days off. What I'm going to say next is not anti-day off. I'm going to preach about Sabbaths in a little bit. But if you look at the Old Testament, the Levites, the priests, they had to work on the day off because it was Sabbath. It was the church day. So they had to do the church stuff while everyone else was off. There was this idea of, I'm the leader here, but I'm actually here to serve and take care. Um, it's important that you know that the priest, his standards had to be lived higher than the standards of everyone else. He had to be holier. He had to work harder. His, his life had to be at another level so that people that were leading, following him could have something to be inspired to. Are you following me? You had to be the example if you were the priest. The pressure that I feel to live my life a certain way because I'm the pastor of the church and I might bump into you at Starbucks and I can't be a jerk and I can't be rude and I have to be godly. This is the pressure good pressure that every husband shall feel on their life when they step into the threshold of their home. Husband, lead by example. Yes, that's good. Lead by example. A lot of guys will be like, well, the man was made first, so he should be the first to eat and the first to sit down and the first to get priority. I like to work that, that line of thought out. Amen. The man was made first. All right, so husband, since you were made first, go first. Well, baby, I just think we should probably save money and spend less. Okay, baby. You go first. <laughs> what, what, what are you going to cut on? Are you going to cut back from going to golf every weekend to every month? Because you might have to make those cuts first. I think we should have more sex, baby. I think we should have more sex. Oh, okay. I think you should do more chores in the house so that we can have more time. 
You go first. You go first. Husbands, listen to me. Be the first to apologize. Be the first to forgive. Be the first to say, I'm sorry. Be the first to serve. Well, she needs to get right. Be the first to get right, because you ain't right either. Be the first to get right. Are you with me, men? Say amen. amen. Listen to me, husbands. You don't lead through intimidation. You lead through inspiration. Yeah. Live your life in such a way that your wives are like, yes, I want to be there. I want to get there. They're, they're pushing me higher. Not just in the natural, but in the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 11.3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is who? The head of every man is who? Christ. So don't get focused on the next part. The head of the wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. But the head of every man is who? Christ. So husband, here's a question you're going to have to be thinking about on your way home. Who are you submitted to? Well, my wife's got to submit to me. And are you submitted to Christ? Because submission doesn't work if the chain is broken. You got to first submit to Christ. You got to first live your life following Jesus. You got to be the first to say, hey, babe, let's go to church today. Come on, I know we're tired. It was a late night, but we can't miss. Hey, I'm going to pray tonight. You want to pray with me? I'm a, if you don't pray, it's cool. No, no judgment. I'm going to pray tonight. When you wake up in the morning, they should walk downstairs. You got your coffee and you got your Bible open because you're the first to, to lead that family through a psalm. You're the first to call a, a fast because you are the priest of your home. Man, you got to be Joshua when he gets into the promised land in the book of Joshua and everybody else is about to wild out and he says this to his family. This your next tattoo husband but as for me and my household that's a good time to clap men that's the time to say amen that's the time to praise the lord but as for me and my household we're gonna serve the lord me and my kids me and my wife we're going to church we're gonna love jesus we're gonna put him first in our lives that's what i declare as the leader and priest of our home why because you have to be following jesus to make it as easy as possible for your wife to be following you. So that if she ever loses trust in you, she maintains her trust in Christ. But, wives, what happens if your husband doesn't have a relationship with the Lord? Yeah. What happens if he's not spiritually where, he, where you would like him yeah. to be? What do you do then? If that's true, then this next point applies to you and all present and future wives. And the next point is the wife's role is influential life giver, influential life giver. And I just want to share um, a scripture in Genesis about Eve, but before I do get into this portion of scripture, it's important to understand that before this part happens, Eve was created. So the rib was taken out of Adam and she's created, but like immediately after she's created, this is the next thing that we read in the Bible and that's that the serpent tries to start to deceive her. So she's created and deception happens. So this is Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, and this part is important too, did he really say, so he starts to deceive her, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say we must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows what you eat from it. Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And this part is important too. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, the reason why I'm reading this scripture is because, again, she was created, and then the devil came to deceive her, the serpent. And why this is so important is because I feel like when I read this, from what I understand is that the devil knew that he couldn't get to Adam because he had such a good relationship with God that as soon as Eve came on the scene, he was like, I'm going to go after Eve because I understand. This is the devil. I understand that God created Eve in a way that she has so much influence on her husband that I know if I get after her, then that means I'm getting after him too. Ladies, what I'm trying to tell you is even the devil knows knows the influence that we as wives have on our husbands. And so I'm going to read that part again where it says, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. I wrote it this way, whatever we consume, whether good or bad, we share with our spouses. Whatever we consume, whether good or bad, we share with our spouses. Yeah, you can clap to that because it's true. God gave us influence on our husband. So we have to decide whether what we're going to share with our spouses, is it going to be life-giving or is it going to be destruction? And I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just share really quickly. When I turned 40 years old, I was having a 
really difficult time in my life. I guess you could call it a midlife crisis. I went to counseling for this. He didn't call it, my, my counselor didn't call it a crisis. He just called it an issue. It was an issue, okay? Midlife issue. Midlife issue. When I turned 40 years old, I don't know what came over me. I was so excited about turning 40, but something happened and the devil did just like he did with Eve to me. He started to tell me, did he really say? And so the devil started putting lies in my head and making me think, Liz, did he really say you needed to start this church? Did he really say you needed to sacrifice everything? Because that's what I felt like I was doing in the moment. I started to feel trapped. Did he really say that, that you needed to, to, to do what you're doing? I felt like everything that I was doing was for everybody else. Like I'm Justice and Zane's mom. I'm Pastor JJ's wife. Like nothing that I do is for me. And I, he started to see negative thoughts and doubt to the point that sometimes I didn't even want to come to church on a Sunday. It's hard to say. It was a difficult time. And I remember remember, sorry if I get emotional, I remember feeling like I was feeding my husband doubt. And, I, and, and what I was consuming, I started to feed to him. Why? This is why I'm telling you it's so important. I realized at that moment when I started to feel like I was affecting him that I couldn't do that. And I needed to make sure. The problem with Eve was that she just came on the scene. So maybe she didn't have a tight relationship with God at the moment. And that's why it's so important for us ladies to have a, a good relationship with God. Because what we need to be consuming is not our thoughts and the devil's thoughts. And did he really say? But God speaking to us. We need to be in community union with God so that everything, we make sure that everything that we download from God, then we can feed him good things. So maybe you come home and you're complaining or whatever, and, and you have discontentment, you're feeding that to your spouse. You need to be feeding yourself with thankfulness so that you can feed that same good thing to your spouse. So that leads me to my next point, wives and courage. That's what we were created for, encouragement. Genesis 2.18 said, the Lord said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I joke about this, but I feel like it's true. They need help, okay? <laughs> this is what we're here for. We are their helper. They need help. And when we think of helpers, we think of someone who's second grade. They're the assistant, not doing the real work, but that's not true. The Hebrew word um, in this scripture is ezer, which means nourish, sustain, strengthen, power. Ladies, we have a superpower, and it's not in our hips. It's in our encouragement to our spouses, okay? So download that. Make sure you, you use that superpower. And you know who else God calls helper? Like he said before, is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Because we are supposed to be ladies like the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm making sure I stress that you understand that we need to be like the Holy Spirit. Because God, for especially for you ladies that your husbands are not serving God, God never called you to be Jesus in his life, okay? You are not his savior. So stop trying to be his savior. I wrote it this way. You can't be Jesus, but you can be like the Holy Spirit and point him to Jesus. You can point him to Jesus by your example, by the way you are, by the way you love. You also can't be God the Father. Wives, he didn't ask us to be God the Father in their lives. So don't try to be their mother. They already have a mother. They don't need another mother. One of the best ways you can kill your husband's motivation is to treat them like a child. Don't treat them like a child. You can't be Jesus in their life. You can't be God, but you can be the Holy Spirit. And last week, unfortunately, when I turned 40, I was feeding him doubt. But last week, I did something good. He, he, he a was, lot of things good. Okay. <laughs> but he had a really hard time last week on the message. It was a really tough message. Um, I know we're running out of time. It was a really tough message. And I remember him coming upstairs at night um, last Sunday and he just looked discouraged and I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm just, I'm discouraged right now. And I'm like, is it because of the message? He's like, yeah, I had a really hard time with it because the topic he talked about was so tough. And I remember just looking at him in his eyes and I'm like, babe, I had to do like the Holy Spirit does in his life. And I had to bring to his remembrance everything that God had told him. And I told him, God, I told him, babe, God didn't ever tell us that this was going to be easy, but he did tell us to be obedient, and that's what you did, and I honor you for that. And it is a power. It's the power to either point, point at the worst in your spouse or pull out the best of them. We all have that power. And what if you're here today and you're like, yeah, but if you knew my husband, if you knew my wife, they got a lot more worse than best. Y'all seem like y'all 50-50. My spouse is 80-20. Um, first off, that's not nice. <laughs> but it might be true. It might be true. And if that's true, I want to reread Ephesians 5.21 to you. And further, 
submit to one another out of respect for her? Her respect for me? Out of reverence for Christ. Why? Because the question isn't, are they worthy? The question is, is Christ worthy? Because if Christ is worthy, then Christ becomes the one that holds y'all together when the other person does things that make them feel unworthy or undesirable. He becomes the rock that holds them together. There have been times when we have held hands in this relationship and we have wanted to break this. Yeah. It did not, the frustrations when I came out with my struggle with, that I shared to my wife and it was a time where she could have let go. It was a time where I wanted to run and hide. But the thing that held us together is that we were never bound to each other. We're bound to Christ. And Christ became the one that held us together. This is the secret to making it. Make sure that Christ holds you together. Would you hold that for me, babe? I'm going to pray with them real quick because of the time. First off, listen, I want to do a prayer. But before I do a prayer, I want husbands and wives, as single people, you can ask the Lord. Lord, continue to make me, shape me in this area. But I want you to ask this question on your way home today. What's your picture of a husband and a wife? What's the changeable roles that you have in your mind? And are you willing to become the unchangeable role, whether that is sacrificing or whether that is submitting? And have that conversation on the way home and, and, and try and become that thing um, that God wants you to become. But I want to... I want to pray for you. I want to pray for all the couples in the room, but I also want to pray for those, listen, who it's going to be hard for me to submit to my spouse because I haven't submitted to Jesus yet. And I think there are a lot of us in this room, man or woman, who listen, we still have an unsubmitted heart to Christ. And we need to first get that in line with him before we can get that in line with anyone else. So with every head, but every eye closed, this is what your prayer is today. Lord, help me submit to you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for every man, every woman, every husband, every wife. Help us to submit to you and only to you. God, we need your humility, the humility you showed when you went to the cross. We need your willingness, the willingness you showed in the Garden of Gethsemane where you said, yet, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We need to be like you, Jesus. Help us to be like you. Help us to carry our cross and submit and follow you because we know that as we follow you, we'll be able to submit, we'll be able to sacrifice, we'll be able to heal our family the way you designed it. If there's anybody in this room today who needs to make that official, you've been far from God, you have not been following him, but today is your chance to come back home on the count of three. If you're in this room, if you're over at University High School, if you're watching online and you say, I need to submit or resubmit my life to Christ, that's what's going to heal. That's what's going to mend. That's what's going to build. I've been chasing this person. I've been working on this broken relationship, but I need to work on my brokenness first. That's you on the count of three. I want you to raise your right hand high to the sky as a signal of Jesus. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to give in. Jesus, I'm ready to give in on the count of three. One, two, three free right now all over this building all over university high school all over online come on so many hands so many hands you go ahead and put your hand down whether you raise your hand or not i want everybody in the room to pray this prayer out loud with me everyone say father god, father god i'm ready i'm ready to give in to give in i make you my lord, make you my lord and i allow you to lead my life, lead my life in the way you choose, way you choose. forgive me for my sins. my sins be my lord, be my lord. And, savior and savior jesus today I put my trust in you. Trust in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together. Welcome all those to the body of Christ, to the family who made a decision to follow Jesus today. Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez, and we wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498 we would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, don't let the journey stop there. we love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all. Subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.